Antonio Damasio has written the book that George Soros gave me three copies of. Over many different times and many different months, I think he probably lent them all to me, but three different times he gave me a copy of Descartes' Error with great enthusiasm, and I read it with great enthusiasm. And we're very, very excited that Dr. Damasio could join us tonight. To introduce Dr. Damasio is INET's own psychotherapist. David Tuckett, who's written a book called The Mind of the Market. And after my speech today, I th was thinking you have to do the sequel called The Mind of Society to broaden the perspective. But, but David, who uh, even before INET started when we met, has been a tremendous, tremendous creative influence and, and really follows his own voice. And, and, and the, we say the different drummer in his head. Pete Townsend's music, which I introduced with, is called Is It In My Head? And uh, David is one of these clever men who pretends to be my tennis coach when he's actually INET's psychotherapist. <laughs> so at any rate, David, please uh, take the stage. We look forward to uh, your thoughts and Dr. Damasio's presentation. This is very exciting. Thank you very much indeed, Rob, for that introduction. I, I'm going to start by introducing Antonio, and then he will speak, and then we will uh, invite you to ask questions and try to have some uh, bit of a, a discussion. Antonio Damasio is a university professor, David Dornsiff Professor of Neuroscience, and Director of the Brain and Creativity Institute at the University of Southern California. He is also an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. He is also an adjunct professor, sorry, Damasio has made seminal contributions to the understanding of how the brain processes memory, language, emotions, and decisions, and has described his discoveries in best-selling books Descartes' error, as Rob has said, the feeling of what happens, and looking for Spinoza. And these have been translated and taught in universities worldwide. He's the author of numerous scientific articles, and his research has received continuous federal funding for 25 years. He's a recipient of many awards, including the Honda Prize 2010, the Asturias Prize in Science and Technology, and the Signore Prize, which he shared with his wife, Hannah Damasio, who's here this evening. Damasio is a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Bavarian Academy of Sciences, and the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. He has been named highly cited researcher by the Institute for Scientific Information and also holds honorary doctorates from several universities. His most recent book, Self Comes to Mind, has just appeared in paperback, and we look forward, oh, I do, very much to his talk, which will be called Human Decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, David, and uh, thank you very much, George, for inviting me, and Robert as well. Uh, we're enjoying this meeting tremendously, Hannah and I, and I realize now that I've been hiding in neuroscience meetings and economic meetings are much more fun. Uh, <laughs> now, now that you know that I'm a neurologist and neuroscientist, I know that you are not expecting me to solve the problems of sovereign debt or the euro, uh, and I can just talk a little bit about something that I may know a little bit about, and that is how the brain uh, and one's own mind makes decisions especially good decisions. And uh, let me start, because we don't have much time, uh, with uh, the first slide, which talks about the fact that our departure point on this problem was really to be very puzzled about what one would call the traditional view of advantageous decision-making, which tends to glorify intellectual 
processes as if they were in fact quite effective and capable. And um, basically, given a particular problem, a conscious knowledge of facts and logic analysis would be not only sufficient to decide well, but would also um, knock out <laughs> the uh, negative influence of emotions. And this is a very important part of this uh, rationalist tradition, is that not only is it perfectly capable, provided we have enough information and logical instruments, but also it assumes that it will block out uh, the nefarious uh, effects of, um, of emotion. Now, uh, there's some problem with the um, uh, rationalist view, uh, and by the way, the path to optimizing decisions would simply be to acquire increasingly detailed knowledge and to improve deployment of those uh, logical instruments. Now, the rationalist perspective overlooks important facts. Uh, for example, that rational thinking is rife with hidden biases and prone to all manner of illusions. And I'm sure that everyone in the audience is familiar with the kind of uh, biases that uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman uh, talk about, and that certainly violates the idea that uh, you know, this rational approach is so perfect. Uh, not only that, and this is um, uh, quite important, Animals, complex animals as well as simple, have engaged in largely successful decision making regarding the management of their lives, individually and socially, throughout a large span of biological evolution. And yet, their conscious knowledge of facts is limited, and the ability to apply logical analysis to facts is implied rather than overt. Uh, and this is something that obviously needs to be considered. So our approach to this problem uh, came from three things. One, a neurological observation that I will describe to you very briefly. Second, a hypothesis that was prompted by the observation. And third, a hypothesis-driven program of neuroscience research. So let me start with the observation. And the observation was that Certain patients who had sustained damage to a specific sector of the frontal lobe, but who were entirely normal deciders until the time of brain damage, were now, after the damage, reaching counterproductive, personally disadvantageous decisions, in spite of the fact that they mastered the facts of the situation and could think through the facts logically. Now, what is very important to note here is not that they are doing better or worse decisions on some scale of quality of decisions, but the fact that the decisions were not only bad, but against themselves, but also quite different from the decisions that they took before they had the disease and they had damage to their brains. And just to give you very brief examples, the areas of decision making that were most problematic had to do with their own persons. So for example, they would decide not advantageously in personal issues, such as for example, who were their friends, what happened to their family, what happened to their relatives, uh, things that had been very well considered up to the point of disease were now no longer considered well, and in fact, their behavior was quite irresponsible from that point of view, and obviously not very good for, their, for the continuation of their lives. The other actually had to do with the financial decisions that they make, and this may be of interest to you in the audience, is that these people became extremely prone to all sorts of hair-brained uh, uh, stratagems that would be foisted upon them. And they were extremely careless with the way they ran their pensions, the way they ran their money, the purchases they made. And there was, again, of course, lots of people behave that way to begin with. Um, but here, there was a very remarkable difference between, between what had gone on before the illness and what was now present in these individuals. So, um, just to give you an idea of what was wrong with them, I'm showing you a normal brain, this is a brain, of course, of a human, uh, this is not post-mortem, this is a reconstruction of the brain in three dimensions done in Hannah's laboratory using modern neuroimaging 
techniques, uh, and uh, you see uh, entirely normal several cortex. And what I'm going to show you now is the image, the reconstruction of the image of the brain of actually the very first patient who gave us the idea that something quite different from the usual was happening. And you can see that there is damage in this brain in an area of the frontal lobe that I'm trying to point to, which is difficult at this distance, and the damage is bilateral, it's on both the left and the right side. The damage is in the frontal lobe, but not all over the frontal lobe, it's in a very specific sector, which is known as the ventromedial sector. And this is a sector that uh, 15 to 20 years ago, we were not actually quite um, as knowledgeable as we are today, and now we know that it's actually a much older area phylogenetically, and it really serves as a crossroads between a variety of ancestral emotional systems and modern systems that are more related to intellectual um, processes. And over the years we have been able to uh, find numerous other cases that fit this pattern and where the damage is in fact systematically located in this particular sector. Now, um, because the only other formal symptom in these patients pertain to a defect in the deployment of emotions, we hypothesized that the decision failures were due to the lack of an emotional signal. Um, and that's actually what we put together, the idea that everything else was so intact and the, intellectually they were so fine and their IQs were maintained and yet there was this pervasive emotional defect that literally turned them into uh, uh, some, some kind of sociopath all of a sudden when they had not been there, um, when they had not been like that before. Um, and uh, because emotions are deeply related to the governance of life within the body, the soma, I call this the somatic marker hypothesis. And in a variety of papers, the first of which was actually published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society and another one in Science in the mid-90s, we called this the somatic marker hypothesis, and that's how it has been known since then. Now, I want to alert you to the fact that the term emotion here is code for homeostatic regulation. It's really code for um, systems in our biology that regulate life and that literally regulate life for us before we start regulating life as modern human beings uh, do. And that the term emotion hides a variety of layers of homeostatic regulation, which includes drives, motivations, and very importantly, includes the levers of reward and punishment. So nothing of what I say makes any sense if you don't consider emotions well beyond those true and tried emotions everyone talks about, such as fear, uh, anger, uh, joy, uh, happiness and sadness, or social emotions such as compassion or contempt or pride. There has to be a consideration that all of these systems operate in a setting of either rewards or punishments, and that they sit atop a hierarchy of controls that include drives and motivations. And I was very happy to hear Dennis Snower this afternoon talk about drives and motivations and about this machine of regulation because it is in fact quite critical. So how did we go about testing this idea that emotions in this very broad sense could be uh, really the cause and could be behind the defects of decision making of these patients? And we started with a very, very simple um, task which has become known as the gambling task. And for you that are familiar with uh, very complex economic and financial instruments, this will sound to you extremely comical and simple, but actually it, it uh, proved to be quite good uh, and effective. And I'm going to give you the version, the original version of the gambling task, which of course these days is given in computerized form, but which when we began we thought we should give in relatively realistic terms. So we actually had patients, as well as normal individuals, uh, play a game of cards. And the game of cards had in front of them 
four decks, and we actually labeled them with letters such as A, B, C, and D. There was money on the table, and we gave the following information to the subjects. First, they had to turn one card at a time. Second, for every turn, there would be a reward, and they were told that there would be a reward, perhaps, but they were also told that on occasion there would be a penalty. And we were told that they had to, they were told that they had to make as much money as possible. Now let me tell you what they did not know and what we hid from them. Is that first, decks A and B uh, were the decks where the rewards appeared, and the rewards were always at the level of hundred dollars when the card would be turned. Decks C and D only gave $50 of reward. But then there were penalties, and the penalties were like this. In decks A and B, which were the high-paying decks, the penalty could go up to $1,200. On decks C and D, it never went beyond $300. The playtime was 100 turns, and they did not know that either. Um, and it's quite clear that if they would prefer decks C and D, they would, would end up winning, and if they would prefer decks A and B, they would end up losing their shirts. But they did not know that. So what we thought of doing here is the following. We had a basic uh, task uh, in which we could analyze behavior of normal as well as patients, uh, normal individuals in patients that had damage to the frontal lobe and patients that had damage elsewhere in the brain. Second, we could monitor uh, their, their uh, reports of the experience they had, and we could also monitor uh, objective effects of emotion, such as, for example, measuring heart rate and skin conductance responses. And then we could correlate all this with what happened in their brains, either with structural brain imaging or with functional brain imaging, for example, using fMRI or a positron emission tomography. So we had the basic situation for uh, conducting experiments in which uh, hypotheses could be tested. And so I'm going to show you a first, this is actually from one of our very first studies, in which we were looking at normal controls and we were looking at skin conductance responses. So we are going to appear, uh, we're going to see appearing the mean anticipatory skin conductance responses uh, measured in micro siemens, and then you have the position of the card that uh, is given below. And what happened is that if you had normal individuals and they were playing from decks A and B, the very high paying decks, but also the ones that gave the high penalties, um, you could see a rising emotional response via the proxy, which is skin conductance response, and the responses became more and more intense, and at a certain point, they stopped playing if they were normal individuals, okay? Uh, if you interrupted the game at that point and asked them about what was going on, it is quite common that before card 20 or even 30, the subjects did not know what was going on. They thought that they were exploring the situation. And yet, the skin conductance responses that were being generated non-consciously were already giving them a signal that something was very, very wrong with decks A and B. On the other hand, if you looked at decks C and D, you realized that their skin conductance responses were far flatter. Now, take a look at what happened with frontal lobe patients. And what happened is that if you go to decks C and D, allegedly the good decks, the responses were very similar actually to uh, the ones you obtain in normal individuals. But when you went to decks A and B, the bad decks, the responses were equally flat. So in fact, the patients were not making a discrimination, consciously or non-consciously, um, of the difference between the good decks and the bad decks. And that was obviously uh, quite interesting for us. And there were numerous other experiments. I'm just going to talk about one that may be of interest to you, in which uh, patients, as well as normal individuals, as well as subjects that had brain damage, but not in the frontal lobe, were asked to go through investment rounds. 
and they were not told, but in fact, as they continued investing, they would keep losing their money until finally they had none. They were not told about this, so this is a situation in which through several rounds of investment, they went, they went gradually into bust without ever having a bubble. So, uh, and here what, you see what happens is that the control patients and the normal participants actually started quite gradually avoiding to play uh, whereas the target patients continued playing blissfully until they lost all the money. Now, um, let me show you just one more image of the brain, and that has to do with a different kind of uh, technical approach. This has to do with fMRI, functional magnetic resonance, and what I'm going to show you actually is not patients at all, but two subjects out of a very large group of subjects that we studied and that we had divided between those that had very good performance on the gambling task and those that did not do so well. And by the way, in case you're interested, these were actually older subjects because we were very intrigued with the idea that sort of of necessity as you get older, you would get somewhat more relaxed about how you make your decisions and the decisions would be impoverished. That's definitely not the case. What happens is that there is a subgroup of people that as they get older in this task tend to do less well. But you remain with a majority of individuals performing at very high levels. And so what you're going to see is two subjects, one on the left, subject A, and one on the right, subject B. And the one on the left is a good performer and the one on the right is a bad performer and you're going to see a sequence of slices that are going to be cutting from left to, from right to left and you see the direction in which the slices are going to appear and I'm now going to slide them very rapidly and I have to give you a warning because this is very fast and what you're going to see is the degree of activity that appears in the frontal lobe or does not and that is signaled by the colors orange and red. So here we go, pay attention. Good performance, poor performance. And there you go. And we now stopped at the midline just to show you that the subject who is a good performer actually has very high levels of activity in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and it literally this subject has activity where the patients that don't perform well have damage. And this is now normal brain operating normally. And curiously, the subject that is not a good performer never succeeds in having the activity coalesce in the region of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. On the contrary, there's activity that is much more scattered. And now we're going to go from the midline and continue, and you will see that again on the left side there was quite a lot of organization in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex but not so on the right. So uh, to summarize as far as somatic marker hypothesis goes you could say that emotion plays a role in decisions given these data consciously in the form of a gut feeling or non-consciously via a biasing of the decision-making process. You could also say that the marker, what I like to call the marker in the somatic marker hypothesis, is a memory trace recorded in ventromedial prefrontal cortex. We're not talking about centers of decision making. This is not it. I can show you lots of other decisions that would not require this particular system. But what the marker signals in our interpretation is the conjunction of certain categories of situation and decision outcome with the accompanying emotional responses. So over time, you go through a process of learning in which you pair the existence of certain kinds of situation and certain strategies to solve the problem and decide with the kind of emotion, positive or negative, that accompanied that decision. And so you have the possibility of generating a relatively fast system of honing in on what is likely to be more advantageous more rapidly. Now, uh, keep in mind that if you're learning the wrong uh, pair, you will of course not produce good decisions and this is possible 
if you're ignorant or if you're not very smart, or if you're dealing with problems that obviously cannot be captured by this very simple, um, by this very simple task. And third, the way we think this operates in normal situations is that upon the representation of a given situation, we're going to have a reactivation of the marker, which in turn replicates the respective emotional state and weighs in on the decision process, consciously or not. So what we're asking here is not for emotion and uh, other aspects of um, uh, biological control to do anything magic. We're simply asking that this trace, this rather dumb trace that exists in neural tissue and could be captured by a certain group of neurons that have been wired together upon learning, to have that uh, come back to revive, for example, in the form of an as-if emotion and an as-if feeling, the situation that was originally paired with that particular emotional response. Um, and that, of course, would be accompanied also by a larger, um, by a larger uh, evocation of the data that went with that situation. And uh, I, I would say, um, in, in closing this particular part of the story, that uh, lack of emotion in this broad sense of the term is certainly a problem for decision making. But I'm not uh, uh, suggesting to you that the bad reputation that emotions got in, uh, as um, uh, uh, disturbers of uh, proper reasoning is completely unearned because in fact we know that excessive emotion can produce errors of decision making, there's no question about that. I'm just submitting to you that having no emotion at all is even worse. And I'm also not going to tell you that in, in certain kinds of um, mis- um, function of emotion, such as, for example, when there are addictive behaviors, that in fact the addictive behaviors, which are of course very emotional in of themselves, cannot hijack the system and render the entire reasoning operations uh, inoperative. Of course they do. It's just that there is a very big difference between uh, emotions being disruptive and emotions uh, being disruptive all the time. They are not. In fact, I think that most of the time they are not disruptive. So let me turn then to a question which I think is an important one. So why should emotions play a a role in decision making at all? Why does this make any sense in case it does? And here's my answer to that. I think the answer is that from simple species with no brain at all, but with control systems that are equivalent to brains, such as for example you have in an amoeba or paramecium, up to complex species such as ours with brains, minds and a complex life, an emotional machinery has been constructed over evolutionary time to cope with the management of life. And that's, of course, what we call homeostasis. Now, this is not a small problem, but it's a problem that is very often forgotten by uh, anyone who is trying to be extremely objective about modeling human behavior. Now, this, this, these systems of decision are extremely old and extremely efficient, otherwise we would not be here. The fact that we and many other species before us have triumphed and are still on the face of the earth, whether we're talking about ants or lizards or birds or mammals, is because we have this incredibly sophisticated system of largely automatic decision making that is devoted to a very incredible problem, which is the problem of life, okay? so. This, I think, is the main reason why we have to factor in emotion. Now, when I talk about uh, management of life, I'm talking about control of operations, I'm talking about choices, I'm talking about decisions regarding, for example, when an organism engages or refrains from certain actions. And the other thing is that when I talk about control, choice, or decision, I'm not implying that a conscious agent is in charge of the process. 
The concepts simply mean and simply describe the fact that control devices in the organism regulate its operations relative to the critical goals it has to achieve. And I'm going to give you the list of the goals for you to realize that this is not trivial. First, maintain life. It's not easy. Second, secure the integrity of the soma. Third, continue the species. And fourth, manage the social environment. And again, if you just think of social environments as human environments, I don't think that that's correct because even bacteria forming colonies are actually having quite complex social behaviors in terms of how they aggregate, in, in terms of how they come together and are almost eusocial or separate. And a lot of that has to do with the resources that are av available in the environment. And there's no brain, there's no political agent, there's no uh, economic theory that is guiding their behavior. That behavior is coming from the ground up. Now, next, the, the point that is in fact the most important is that emotions have been built on a background of drives, such as appetites, and motivations, such as play, exploration, care, and attachment. Now, why is this important? You know, think of drives. Uh, they're all associated with emotions. They're all associated with rewards and punishments. But what they do in the basic drives is to ensure that we ingest food, that we ingest drink, that we engage in sexual behavior, or we simply will not have any of those fundamental goals such as preserving the soma and uh, continuing a species. And then you have this very complex area of motivations. And again, uh, Dennis Snower mentioned uh, motivations this afternoon, such as play, exploration, care, attachment. Now, these are motivations that you can find in a variety of lowly species. This is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a human trait. These are present, of course, they're present in spades, in, in mammals and in birds, and in fact, even in reptiles and fish. But there they are, and there's the sense of play. There's the sense of exploration of the environment. There's the fact that there's a care of the other. Uh, and the care very often aimed at the progeny, but not necessarily. In certain conditions, it manifests itself eusocially. And there is attachment, which is also a very important part of the, uh, of the equation. So, um, drives motivations and emotions can be experienced as feelings, and here is where we go up a little bit in the scale, because uh, when we think about feelings, I, I happen to be convinced that in fact most species that we can study in biology have feelings and have some form of sentience, but it could be disputed. Certainly in humans we do have feelings and we certainly, nobody's going to doubt that mammals have feelings and what feelings are is mental purchases of what is going on in the regulation of the organism at a given point. And what feelings are doing is the mapping of the state of the body at a given point and allowing you, once the brain is complex enough, to have an experience. But the point remains that in humans as well as not, drives, motivations, emotions, and feelings, if they're present, simply provide different levels and ranges of control in the process of life management. We're still talking about life management uh, through and through. And uh, finally, um, this point. The prodigious expansion of memory, symbol manipulation, and consciousness that, of course, we have, has allowed humans to create instruments of social and political organization economy and finance, as well as moral systems, law, medicine, arts, science, and technology. And uh, this is something that I very firmly um, happen to believe, is that we make a very terrible mistake when we take instruments of culture, instruments by which we run our lives uh, today and which are of course very much a part of what we discussed throughout the day, as if those systems appeared de novo once brains were large enough without any connection to what came before. 
Now, my contention would be that all of these systems are nothing but projections of our biological system into, of course, a very complex brain capable of enormous feats of mind. And so there is an umbilical cord that links what one could call sociocultural evolution to the biological evolution that came before. And the two things are tied. Now, in what way is this of any consequence, I think, for anybody who is interested in the future? Uh, is that, for example, the kind of story that we heard this morning from uh, George Soros and which I uh, uh, resonate which resonates with me quite uh, strongly, is the idea that when you talk about fallibility and when you talk about reflexivity, you're really dealing with problems that come out of the fact that we have this sort of relatively new, it has only a few hundred thousand years as opposed to billions of years, that has appeared and that is full of imperfections. And so not only do we deal with a problem that we cannot uh, we, we cannot predict the future, even if we know quite a lot, but we also have a system that we tend to believe is perfect, that the system, if you treat it with the attitude of a natural scientist who is looking at the past and who can find facts and discuss them and test them in formal experiments, we convince ourselves that these systems have a perfection and a capacity that, in fact, I doubt very much they have. And when we complain about the perils of uncertainty and the perils of ambiguity, we're simply uh, showing very clearly that even with all the smarts in the world, with very high computation, with incredible gathering of facts, we don't know the future, and we have a big problem in uh, running uh, a system that will uh, satisfy all the complexities that we're facing and that are uh, increasing all the time. And so, before I interfere with your digestion, I'm going to stop right here, and if you would like to ask questions, I'd be delighted to answer. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, and I'm sure you will have produced a great deal of food for thought on top of the food people have already had. And uh, just before we start, I want to make a, a few short remarks, because I think the crucial question for economic thinking, in a way, is so what? In other words, does it matter to economic theory, and does it matter to the development of new economic theory that we know or not this interesting and convincing information about the way the mind works. And here I think I would like to pick up from the contributions already made from George Soros, from, for example, Dennis Snower, from Gert Gigerenza, uh, from Ronald uh, Roman uh, Friedman earlier where the essence of all those contributions start with the issue of uncertainty. The, the distinction that has long been known in economics and made by Knight and so on between risk and uncertainty. Because what we're talking about here when you're talking about how does life uh, go forward is clearly in a situation which is inherently uncertain or has been for large amounts of the time. So the, the starting point is, as uh, Antonio put it, that we don't know the future. And so the decision making that we need to understand in economics, it seems to me, depends on the extent to which we feel what we're trying to do is to understand situations in economics where the future is unknown. Now, there are diff so that even the word uncertainty I'm avoiding here because it seems clearer if one says the future is unknown. It's much more difficult to get around that particular problem by uh, other, other sorts of, of devices. Now, my own way of thinking about that uh, is, is linked to the idea that the essential problem that economic actors have, particularly in financial markets but also entrepreneurs, is how to support action. And the issue here is not that they 
contemplate and do all this maximization and optimization, but that actually they have to act, and as they act, they have subjective experience, which I think is described immediately by the kind of emotions that, that we're talking about here. My particular take on this, which is not the only one, is that, the, that action is supported both by the heuristics you heard about from uh, Gerd Gigerenza, but also by narrative. That is to say, the, a way in which uh, facts and emotions are organized together to provide a sense that uh, it, one can do whatever it is one's planning to do. My own view further is that in finance, the narrative also always has to do two things. It has basically to manage enough excitement, that is, feeling of excitement about the possible gain from the action, and minimize the amount of anxiety about gain, which relates to these fundamental systems that uh, Antonio is talking about. Uh, and that what the narratives do for people when they support action is there has to be a balance of excitement over anxiety, uh, fear of loss. Now, you can, the problem is that in taking that action, if you get what George kindly referred to as the fantastic object, that is the idea of the object which really will give you profits without really so much risk as usual, as, as we had leading up to the financial crisis, then it very easily stimulates a state of mind where the, the possibility of loss, although known, is not paid any attention to. And this then, through the processes of reflexivity and so on, can lead to a situation where an idealized, fantastic object is pursued as if this is a perfectly possible thing, based, I believe, on biological processes to do with essentially falling in love and attachment, that idealization is a very essential... If you think about getting married or something like that, it, it, you know, the reality of the situation is there are ups and downs. So it has to be propelled by something for, for it to work. And what happens in a financial crisis, what I think has happened with the euro, is that once the fantastic object starts not to be, to, not to be experienced as so fantastic, then there is a huge amount of anxiety and disappointment and many other consequences. And the problem then is how to get back to treating the object which usually is always a good idea somewhere, as an ordinary object, and ordinary objects like ordinary people both please you and displease you, satisfy and dissatisfy, although you hope the balance is, is on the positive side. But that requires a process of which psychoanalysts would call mourning or grieving to get back. And so the underlying problem, if you follow George's anal uh, analysis of the euro, is how do we get through the process of accepting loss, of accepting less than perfection, and then get back to, to the project. So with these few remarks, uh, I'd like to throw the uh, discussion open to the floor uh, for questions uh, to uh, Professor Demacia. So who would like to ask a question? Uh, over here, sorry. I, can you give your name? Because I can't see. Uh, Adam Leeds. So this is a really open-ended question, and I hope it won't be considered unfair. Um, but you talked, and I hope again this terminology isn't unfair, from a, what I might call a, a, an upward causation from motivations, appetites, up through feelings, to decisions within sort of sociocultural contexts. If we could talk the other way of what maybe would be a downward causation, um, what are the implications of it um, for these sort of more ancient and fundamental levels? That is, we have cultural organizations of emotion, ways of narrat narrativizing them and incorporating them into recognizable social relationships, as well as canons of logic and procedures of reasoning and inference, um, uh, enabled by all this memory and consciousness and symbolic manipulation that we have. How does all this extra stuff interact with these other more fundamental levels of emotion, appetite, motivation? Cautiously. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm not joking. Uh, so I. Uh, I, I think your question is very interesting. Uh, 
So you, you really have to negotiate. Um, and what, what I think is facing us is this discrepancy between a system, which is the homo basic homeostatic regulation, that is true and tried and has been uh, honed very carefully over biological evolution, carefully in metaphorical sense, and does operate well within certain parameters, um, and can operate without the interference, for example, of consciousness and quite a lot of knowledge. The knowledge is in the system itself. And now you have this new, um, many layers of knowledge that we have put on top of it, and we have a trial and error as we discover systems that can operate. But sometimes the system works very well, sometimes there's a conflict. And I think that if you would look at the, 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 the history, uh, political history for example, it's, it's a, a series of negotiations that basically have to take into account certain new ideas about solutions to problems and the kind of solutions that organisms, living organisms, namely humans, are giving for those problems. But the, 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 there, is, there is a potential conflict and there is the need for negotiation. And it's certainly not going to be in our lifetime that sociocultural instruments attain anything like the perfection that biological systems obviously have. Okay, now we've got quite a few questions, so if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll take three questions and then you as can As many answer. as you wish. Okay, so uh, the lady here, and then... Uh, Sorry? First here? Yep. Ladies, ladies first for a change. Um, if I were to simplify what you were saying, and forgive me if this is a bit unfair, because I've heard in other contexts the emotional brain described as the older brain, the limbic brain and that we have sort of newer, that more advanced species have a cerebral, you know, cerebral cortex and that, that it's basically not terribly well integrated with the older emotional brain. Um, now when we look and, and, you know, we and the people here, you know, economics, social scientists are very preoccupied with the, with the operation of the more rational parts of the brain, as you correctly pointed out at the end, and we didn't get a chance to get into that very much. But the, um, we now tend to dignify the operation of the emotional, the rational brain, as you indicated. And yet there are sort of, even within the intellectual brain, we've got your, your sort of chart indicated that the people sort of were starting to recognize that game was working against them. That if, if they played the A and B, they were getting feedback emotionally that it wasn't working if they hadn't processed it intellectually. And there's sort of a level of recognition between cognition versus pattern recognition that there's, there's sort of pattern recognition, and you see this with, this is something that Malcolm Gladwell wrote about in his book Blink, that, that and I, it may not have been well discussed in other contexts, but people, there's a level of pattern recognition that curators, other experts have. And I'm concerned that in the, expert, the, rep, the, relevant, the realm of expert discourse, and for example, the financial crisis, that people use heuristics often well, and yet badly, that we select professionals, we select, you know, who we trust because we can evaluate them and we rely on proxies. And then, and then we tend not emotionally to reject those people who, who present the right signals or present the right arguments even when, even when they've been very discredited. I mean, have you done any work that gets in that intermediate level between the, you know, when you start getting into rational processes you, we, you've talked about the emotional level, but okay. what about the different levels of rationality, where we've got sort of the simple levels of rationality, where we may not be able to, t we may do ex post facto logical justifications when it's really not logical. Right, thank you very much. Right. And, uh, yes, you there, and then over here. Uh, I have a study here by people at Duke University, brain imaging and neurology uh, department in which they said, uh, the title of the paper is Neuro Neural Signatures of Economic Preferences for Risk and Uncertainty, in which they claim by doing MRI studies of people with brains, they found out that if you prevent, presented them with alternatives and probabilities, that the part of the brain that uh, was active by dopamine neurons was the uh, posterior parietal cortex, 
And if you gave them uncertainties, that is alternatives, and told them there was no probabilities associated, how do you pick that? They said there was another part of the brain called the lateral prefrontal cortex. What does that mean? <laughs> so, do you want to take those two and then we'll have it down here. Okay. So, in relation to that, let me say that um, people very often, in their attempt to understand very complicated issues of brain function, they resort to um, what we call a phrenological approach, in which they talk about centers that do this or do that, and sometimes they even try to relate that to neurotransmitter systems. I think it's very um, risky to do that because we still know very little, and the kind of things that I was telling you at least have the advantage that they have been tried and they're consistent over the years. I'm not making interpretations about whether, for example, there's a neurotransmitter like dopamine that is producing the results that we are talking about. In all likelihood, there are in fact cocktails of neurotransmitters that have enormous uh, amounts of interaction and that can lead to different treatments of probability. But the, the point that that research, and I don't know which particular work you're referring to, but it doesn't make any difference, the, the point that that research is making is that there are certain neurotransmitters that clearly have a role in emotional systems and in reward and punishment systems that are differently engaged by different situations. So the fact that you have an intellectual problem, and this actually also addresses part of the previous comment, if you have an intellectual problem that you need to solve of necessity, you will engage, unless you're not normal, you will engage certain amounts of emotional response that have to do with your basic system of operation for life regulation and with your prior experience of that particular category of problem. And once that happens, the emotional responses will be interfering, either positively or negatively, with what is going on in your intellectual analysis. The, the, the point that I want to leave very clear is that I do not believe for a minute that it is possible to go through life taking decisions every day in all the realms in which we do, whether they have to do with our personal future or with the future of an institution in politics or say as an academic leader. I don't think we can make those decisions purely with rational mechanisms, quote unquote. It's not just about facts and the accumulation of facts. It's not just about the logical analysis. Of necessity, if the system is integral, there is an engagement of those support systems. And um, in the previous question, now I connect to the previous one, there's, it's true that there is an idea that some of the systems are older. There's no question that organisms have been making very fast and effective decisions using not consciousness, not detailed knowledge, but rather, and they're not logic that they know of, but rather emotional systems that embody certain responses that are very effective and that maintain life and that have been conserved in evolution, have been conserved in the genomes precisely because they're effective or they would just die out. So the fact that there is an older quote-unquote brain and a more modern brain is a fact of life. There's no question that these structures that I talked about have very different phylogenetic ages, and some are very old, and some are very recent. Of course, when I talk about very recent, I'm still talking about hundreds of thousands and millions of years, not about 100 years or 200 years. Okay. Can we have the microphone over here? Uh, Adair Turner, Chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority. First of all, can I thank you, Professor Damasio, for a really fascinating talk, which I think is extremely important for economists to uh, uh, think about the implications of. I wanted to ask you about a methodological issue. Listening to you this evening and on everything that I've ever tried to understand about neuroscience and the uh, 
the understanding of the brain. What, I, what I've been struck by is that you often focus on the distinction between the behavior of relatively small minorities, you know, people who have suffered brain damage in one particular area and the vast majority, the, con the control group, and draw inferences to that. What is it methodologically that enables you to draw general inferences about the operation of the brain from the observation of what strike me as relatively extreme circumstances? And I think that was, as I understand it, what was going on today. When you were showing us those two different groups, you were describing people who had suffered some category of, of, of damage to bits of the brain. Right. Uh, how, how do you methodologically work through that problem of what you can infer generally from the distinction between the extreme event and the generality of the population? Excellent question. Thank you very much. So, um, two things. First, I did not show you only um, studies based on lesions of the brain and damage, but also I showed you actually a functional imaging study done in normal individuals. The majority of the studies that we do today are in fact carried out in normal individuals, what we call controlled subjects. I was telling you about these patients with damage because they are the beginning of the story. Now, why are they important? Because they serve, they provide us with a probe into the system. For example, if we never had seen a patient with damage in one specific area and been able to, first of all, describe what was wrong and what was right about that patient, and realize that patients with damage in a variety of other areas did not have the same problem, we would never have tumbled to the fact that the problem existed in the first place, nor would we have had an opening into discovering what the function of this particular system might be. So think of damage in the brain as a probe into the system, a way of opening into the system and trying to understand its logic. And of course, you then need to bring into that study and into the logic lots of knowledge about anatomy, about physiology, and you need to confirm that in a very large number of subjects. So for example, this, this association between the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and these disruptions of advantageous decision making have now been confirmed in countless studies by group after group in different countries, in different languages, and many, many subjects. So you have to start very often with one case, sometimes, or half a dozen cases, and then go and study larger samples and find out if it works or it doesn't. Uh, it's quite interesting to think that the majority of the fundamental knowledge that we have about the human brain to date is still based on single case studies. For example, it was the study of a patient with damage in the lateral, the side part of the frontal lobe in the 19th century that had broca's aphasia and another patient that had damage a little further back in the left hemisphere called Wernicke's aphasia described by Paul Broca in Paris and by Karl Wernicke here in Germany, it was out of those two cases that the entire edifice of language and brain function were built. And guess what? They're still correct, they're still true, and there's been nothing over thousands of cases studied since that violated what those two scientists imagined was the case. But of course, it was only time that tested it. And so I think we have to uh, th these are enormous opportunities that they give us because until relatively recently we did not know what was going on. We had to go from single cases. Uh, to, to give you another example, most of what we know and the fact that we seized on the possibility that a structure called the hippocampus is fundamental for learning of factual memories came out of an observation made by a Canadian scientist uh, called Brenda Milner, uh, and it was actually done in the United States, but she then moved to Montreal, and she made this observation in one single patient, which was a complete fluke. It turned out that the patient had this condition made by a neurosurgical intervention that went wrong, and that should never have been done. As a result of this, we had the first description of factual amnesia, 
And out of that came a whole edifice of knowledge. And so it's, it's very odd the way we start, but you need to start somewhere. And these are, of course, very good probes. But keep in mind that the majority of what is being done today is in entirely normal individuals, of course, with all the variations that humans have from being very smart to being very dumb. OK, now we have lots of hands uh, uh, here. Carlo. Uh, there's and there's one, one, Eric, and one. Yeah. Eric Bergloff down there. Thank you for this presentation, which is going to be a fantastic object in my mind. <laughs> I learned a lot about how you think about emotions. I think I can use it rather immediately for my economic work. I would like you to expand a bit more on rationality, and I want to say why I'm asking that question. In economics, there is a shared understanding of what we mean by rationality. I should say that I'm not very convinced by it, but it's there, it's canonical. The point is, it's not sufficient to use some kind of logic to qualify as being rational in the sense of economics. On the other hand, the economic axiomatic definition of rationality works with very different logics. You can drop the law of excluded middle, still be rational. You can keep it, still be rational. I think these are important differences. With that background, I'm simply asking whether you can just say a bit more about how you think about rationality. Well, uh, very interesting question. I would have to say that I think about it in very plain human terms. And uh, I'm definitely not thinking about it in terms of economic theory, of which I know very little, probably best to say nothing. So I'm thinking about what people traditionally regard as rational behavior versus irrational behavior. So, for example, in relation to that patient, the first patient that I told you about and the kind of patient we're talking about, we regard as non-rational and sometimes downright irrational, behaviors that all of a sudden break with the past history of that individual and that go against the best interests of that individual. That's the way in which we... So it's, it's, it's very much related to the reality of decision, life decision-making of, of these patients. And what is interesting is that these patients, both in the personal realm, how they ran their lives, their in terms of their family, their social relations, and how they ran their finances, and they were, those are the two things that were blatant, uh, were extremely deficient, but they had not been before. Basically, we, we tumbled onto this by the fact that these people were supposedly model members of their social group and very efficient in what they did, and suddenly they were really behaving in a rather psychopathic way. And by the way, it's quite interesting, you may be interested in knowing that it's something that we discovered subsequently and is now a very important aspect of, uh, of ongoing studies, is that in these individuals, um, you, you generally have a break, which I did not talk about, between what they do, their actions, their actual decision-making, and what they think of the actions after. So if you ask them, in retrospect, do you think you did the right thing, they will say, no, I didn't. I, I should not have done that. So there's something that, for example, in relation to a moral action, you can describe as remorse or, or uh, regretting uh, buying something that they should not have bought and that they didn't have money for. If you sustain exactly the same kind of damage in the perinatal period within the very first months and probably years of life, but not very late, still in childhood, it turns out that these patients, when they grow up, not only make all these mistakes, but have absolutely no sense of what they violated. And when you, uh, when you query them, you realize that they never learned the rules. They never learned what is moral and what is not, what is going to be against them and what is not. And these people are very smart, and they are behaving rather blissfully in a world where they actually can be described as um, you know, so, so psychopaths. And so there's the difference between having learned the system, but then failing to make the decisions correctly, and not having learned the system at all. And we think that 
by losing part of the system, you really become rather less in terms of your learning forward. Thank you. Very nice question. Yeah, <coughs> Peter Jung and I, um, I think there's a fascinating talk, but I, I would like to remind, relate this a bit to the topic of new economic thinking. And maybe that's rather on new thinking um, and relating to uh, some people in history uh, which have contributed a lot to economic and social thought. Um, Karl Popper and uh, Friedrich von Hayek on future open systems. And as Roman Friedman in his book said about the pretension of knowledge uh, with Hayek. Um, what, what came to my mind was that Hayek wrote his doctoral thesis on, and the German title was Sensorik. That is, he was a brain researcher before he turned to humanities or social sciences. Uh, just a hypothetical question, what would have happened if he would stayed in his profession and not turned to social uh, science? Of course, it's not easy to answer, but what do we make out of this? That a lot of what we heard from you and from other people's contributions today are based or related at least to uh, thoughts and ideas of people who uh, contributed these ideas about 80 or almost 100 years ago. Um, I would have to know more about their contributions to, to, to tell you uh, how the, you know, I, can, I can see from what I know of Karl Popper wh where the relation uh, would be. Um, I think that the, the, there's still a difference in uh, thinking about an idea and defending that idea and finding some kind of evidence in real systems, as far as the human brain is concerned, for the operations that we're talking about. So, um, the, uh, you know, I'm certainly not the first person to think of the idea that emotions are important in decision making. You know, if you think about Spinoza, Spinoza actually has one of the most profound thoughts that I think uh, have ever been put forward relative to emotion. And that is basically that you can only, let's assume that you have an emotion that is not a good, is not giving you good advice in terms of a decision and that could lead you astray into a very bad decision. Spinoza's idea was that you could only counter that emotion not with a very rational idea that would say, don't do that, but rather with another emotion that would be more powerful than the basic emotion. And I find this very beautiful, and it, it tells us a little bit about the wisdom of Spinoza in this regard, and about the enormous value that he put on the emotional system, which of course he described in the language of the 17th century, not exactly the most perfect from our terms, and rather gross, but he was on the right track. And the idea that you can only counter the emotion that is negative with an emotion that is even more powerful, I find a rather very attractive one. And it's interesting because when you, when you think about what happens, t take addiction. I think addiction is a very good example of a biological condition in which the appetite system runs amok. So whether you are addicted to drugs or sex or rock and roll, uh, it doesn't make any difference. What you have is that the appetite system uh, gets connected in something that is excessive and becomes uncontrollable. By the way, there are beautiful animal models of this. So you can find situations in which, for example, uh, a rat uh, or other uh, species in the experiment will enjoy so much the reward that comes from these hedonic systems, which by the way can be related, those quite legitimately, to certain neurotransmitters such as opioids. For example, there is a part of our brain in the striatum that generates opioids. So you don't need to take uh, opioids from the outside. They're being generated from the inside and they are the main providers of reward. So when you're learning and you're rewarded, you're actually, if you permit my term, spritzing uh, opioids into a variety of networks of your system. Once you have that, you have a system that can very rapidly go downward and uh, 
in the search of that fast and very powerful reward stop working altogether in any kind of rational intelligent sense. So you can describe this as a hijacking of the system. So it's not a question of thinking fast or thinking slow, it's thinking not at all. So you actually stop thinking and you are prey to the emotional system that is guiding you. So if you uh, do like uh, uh, Mrs. Reagan, who recommend you to drug addicts, just don't do it. Um, you know, it doesn't look like it works. Uh, and, but it might work if there would be a way of introducing an emotion that would be more powerful than that which uh, has these people under their sway. So there we go again for Spinoza. So I've gone a little bit further back. Uh, Gerd Kiegerans from Max Planck Institute for Human Development, Berlin. Thank you for your talk. I have a remark and a question. Okay. Uh, start with the remark. I think you put Kahneman's rescue on the wrong side. So you wrote that rational thinking leads to biases. Yeah? That's no, exactly. I didn't. No, I, I said that rational thinking includes biases that yeah. were not. That's not their position. The position is intuitive thinking includes biases. Rational thinking, logic, probability theory is always right in the meaning. Yeah? They're on the, on the opposite side where you think they are, including most of the rest of behavioral economics. For them, emotions can only hurt or harm. They're not on your side. Okay. Just the remark. Yeah? Okay. Uh, question is, uh, the, I try to understand the somatic marker hypothesis. What I understand is that you're saying that emotions are necessary for good decisions. Yeah? My question is, is this about all emotions? No. Every emotion? No. No. And I think Isn't that, it that there are many situations where we better not should think? For instance, if I yes. decide whether I should play in the casino, I just can calculate? Absolutely. And, and, and that's, and that's is exactly. Is there a more precise relationship between uh, emotions and the kind of task that we solve? Right. I, I think, for example, the idea that all decisions that we make, whether you're running a hedge fund or um, you know, deciding uh, whether a convict, uh, whether a, an accused is guilty or not guilty, if you are uh, in a jury, or the decision of whom to marry or whom to befriend or what kind of insurance you ought to buy, I think are very different kinds of decision in terms of the amount of knowledge that they require and the amount of pre-training that they require in order for you to be considered an advantageous decider, advantageous in relation to the problem. So I think these problems are very different. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, you cannot have good decisions uh, without emotions, but in many decisions that you require in day-to-day -day life, the absence of emotion is a problem and manifestly so. But what I'm, what I'm not, uh, not saying at all is that uh, emotion is always the best uh, counselor to you. And in fact, I think I said that in many conditions, emotions can actually be disruptive, especially if they are excessive. The other thing is that I think you're probably, uh, and I, I, I said it, but it may not have been uh, sufficiently clear, uh, I said I use the term emotion as code for a variety of other processes and I said several times that emotion can appear as a signal that is manifest and quite overt and that's the kind of thing that we all experience when you have or when people talk about having a gut feeling that leads them to reject or endorse a certain possibility but very often you don't have such a gut feeling very often you end up producing a certain result, a certain decision. And that decision in many situations is going to be influenced by a covert signal of the kind, for example, that you can identify with uh, something like a skin conductance response. Even if you, once you are inquired about the situation, you do not have knowledge of the situation, factual, conscious knowledge of why you're doing something. So for example, when we take the example of the gambling task, when we interrupted the gambling task, say at card 
15 in people who were already playing less times from that deck uh, and were then very rapidly going to endorse the other decks. They did not know why they were making that choice. So the, something else was influencing their decision that even if they knew it, they did not know it consciously. Of course, they knew it in the sense that there was information in the system, uh, such as the penalty and the punishment that they got when they lost, say, a thousand dollars, that was telling them not to go there because that's dangerous. And that's, of course, no different from the kind of thing that we will do once you intuitively sense that a certain path, a certain street, uh, will, is not going to be good for you to walk in and that you, you're picking up from a variety of clues and you're leading your behavior in a direction and you don't quite know why you did it. I think this happens in everyday life all the time. Okay, now there are quite a few people towards the back. Could, could you each ask a brief question and just pass the microphone and then uh, Professor Damasio will answer. Damaris Kaufman, and this is um, Cambridge. This is actually a follow-up serendipitously on Gerd's question, which is, Watching the functional um, MRIs, there's a sense in which there might be a good performer and a bad performer, but what I took away from that is somebody who's taking this task very seriously and somebody who perhaps is not taking this task seriously at all, and then the person with the prefrontal lobe injury may be somebody who can't take the task seriously because of the nature of the injury and the HPA access and anxiety or fear or what have you. And I guess what I was wondering in terms of connecting your research, the question of an underinvestment in the object versus Professor Tuckett's notion of an overinvestment in the object. Is there a happy medium or is there something else going on um, in terms of the extent to which emotional investment may or may not be desirable in decision making? Right, I think that the emotional investment there will play in terms of, let's say, the quantity of it. So if you have an emotional investment and if you have excessive emotional reactions, as I suggested during the talk, you can actually make rather wrong decisions. And my suggestion is that that's where the bad reputation of emotions comes from. In other words, it, the idea that once you are emotional, you are disrupted in your possibility to analyze the facts uh, coherently. Um, but uh, the people that I, I was focusing on, and there are of course the many other situations in which there are emotional effects that are quite demonstrable, but the people that I'm referring to are people that are rather uh, not, in, not invested at the moment in what they are doing, which, by the way, does not mean that they are not attentive to the task. On the contrary, they're extremely attentive and they're trying to perform well. But that doesn't mean that they do. And the, the best, the, 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 the explanation that fits the best is that, in fact, that like, it's as if they're playing field has become level. There's nothing that uh, sort of quote unquote feels particularly good or particularly bad, either consciously or in the non-conscious version of the feeling process, which ought to be there, but in this case appears not to be. Okay. I'm uh, Julie Nelson, UMass Boston. I wanted to ask if you experienced, uh, maybe even early on in this research, any kind of resistance or blowback within the community of neuroscientists about bringing an emotion as part of good decision making. I say that as an economist because it seems to me that when I want to talk about emotion or interpersonal relationships or ethical judgments, things that are definitely part of human experience and human economic life, in economics those are referred to as uh, thought of as soft and somehow uh, decreasing the scientific nature of the discipline. Right. So, a uh, very interesting question. Let me answer it. Um, first, uh, the, the research on emotion uh, was obviously not a central theme in neuroscience until probably around 1990. And I remember when the first symposium on uh, neuroscience of emotion was held at the Society for Neuroscience was exactly in 1995. The first time I talked at the Society for Neuroscience uh, on emotion, uh, and this is at a time in which all of our past research had been on systems of memory and language, there was uh, 
very good friend and colleague of mine that was sitting in the first row and he just shook his head saying, the poor man is completely uh, gone wild and, this, and then he actually told me, you're just going to destroy your career. I said, well, too bad, we'll try. Uh, and uh, the contrary has actually happened, is that emotion in that first meeting that we organized with myself and a man by the name of Joseph Ledoux, who is at NYU and studies animals and studies actually fear, and we organized this first meeting, and emotion became uh, quite popular. In fact, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's a little bit too popular, and there are people doing research on emotion that they want to apply in every possible field. Neuroethics, neuroeconomics, and by the way, I never use the term neuroeconomics because I, I think that's just uh, absurd to give the impression that we as neuroscientists can understand something like economics from the perspective of the brain. We can say a few things that might be interesting for you or not, as we're seeing from the discussion, uh, but not, not try to solve your problems. That would be completely ridiculous. But I think that these days the evaluation is completely different. This is not only a legitimate field, but actually a very highly cultivated field and it's extremely popular for better or worse and the instruments of research have evolved rapidly and today we can even talk about for example you know one of the bad things about research of emotion in the past is that emotion was confused with feeling but today we have very good ways of oper operationalizing these concepts when we talk about emotion and drives and motivations we're actually talking about actions, actually concerts of action that are taken either consciously or non-consciously and have been taken forever in the, in the path of evolution. Whereas when we talk about feelings, we talk about something very specific, which is the readout of what happens when an organism is engaged in emoting, when an organism in, is engaged in having um, emotions and therefore blocks of actions that have a very particular purpose. And even that we now have a very good purchase on because we know that feeling systems are based on the ability that our brain has in space of monitoring and mapping what is happening to our own body. So when uh, poets refer to uh, emotions by describing, for example, the heart palpitating or the gut or what have you, they are in fact, they were in fact doing uh, neuroscience uh, before their time. So they were describing the contents of uh, the feeling uh, state, which is based on a mapping in actually beautifully laid out maps. Uh, it's really like cartography you bring in signals from the periphery of the body and especially from the viscera and you plot them in coordinates in regions of the brainstem and the cortex that are designed to represent states of the body. And why do we have that? It's not because people want to have feelings to write poetry or uh, be uh, artists. We have that because that is the highest level of monitoring that we can have of the control systems that are involved in drives, motivations and emotions. And without those control systems we can initiate a corrective response but we cannot initiate the cancelling of the response. You need to have a way of signifying at brain level that some, that for example a corrective response that has to do with correcting your blood glucose has been achieved, has achieved its goal and is now ready to be stopped. And unless you have that feedback corrective mechanism, you just cannot do it. So these things are now taken quite seriously and there's no problem, <coughs> nobody would now shake their head about the idea that you were studying emotions, fortunately. Well, I'm, <coughs> I'm afraid we're, we're out of time and I've been asked to bring it to an end. But there are at least 10 or 12 people who were, were wanting to ask questions, and I apologize for not calling you. Why don't you give a question to Eric Bergloff, who is there since the beginning? Ask, is, Eric is trying to ask a question. Oh, OK, fine. Why don't you? Well, uh, <laughs> thank you, Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eric Bergloff, EBRD. Uh, 
Uh, you know, I was struck by some image you showed when, you know, for these, you compare these two individuals and yeah. the ones that had a damaged part or, or less function, well functioning part for emotions, other parts of the brain seem to be activated. So, to what extent can other parts of the brain compensate for this? And to what extent can you train people or do we need to screen people for, for, for these kind of deficiencies? Yeah, that's a very good question. And the answer is that we don't know. Uh, for example, people who have uh, one of the important topics of current research is the, the issue of recovery and plasticity. We know that the brain is far more capable of reorganizing itself after damage. And this is not a, a small problem because as you probably know, lots of people have, for example, strokes or have head injury which leads to damage of the brain. And uh, in the past, the idea was that, well, once you have damage, nothing will happen. I mean, you can, you, you, you are happy if you survive, uh, but you have no way of recovering. And that's simply not true. Uh, what we do not know yet, and that's one of the jobs for the future, is under which circumstances recovery takes place. What are the factors? Well, age is one. Obviously, it's likely that you're going to recover more if you're young than if you're very old, but it's not true all the time. We have seen recovery occur in uh, elderly individuals. Uh, what else? Gender is related to it, maybe in some cases. And then there's a whole slew of possibilities that have to do with how you could try to coax recovery from a brain in terms of retraining and in terms of emphasizing certain tasks over others. But that's basically an unanswered question and I wouldn't give up, you know, yet. Thank you. Okay, so... <laughs> I, I think that the number of questions and the uh, warmth of interest in it is, is a great testimony both to the, how you've... Uh, presented yourself and to interest among economists in a more interdisciplinary approach. So thank, thank you very much for, for, for coming and answering so well. Thank you. <laughs>